Okay, let's go ahead and start. All right, hello everyone to our first com press conference of the last day of our AAS um, 239 meeting press conferences. It is 10.15 Mountain Time or 12.15 Eastern Time on January 13th. And our, com our topic for this press conference will be exoplanets and their atmospheres. My name is Macy Houston. I am the Astrobytes Media Intern this week and um, also a graduate student at Penn State. I am joined today by Susanna Kohler, the AAS press officer, who will be helping with the Q&A this session, and then also helping out with technical things. We have Carrie Hensley, the AAS deputy press officer, and Haley Wall, the AAS media uh, fellow, as well as a graduate student at West Virginia University. Um, today we have five press conferences and um, presentations, and each of those will be associated with a press release that will be available on the AAS website, as well as the AAS Press Twitter account. Our previous day's videos are all online, and the press kit has been updated with links to the presentation files and the press releases. Before we get started, I just want to go through the ground rules of how this uh, press conference is going to go. We are recording this briefing and live streaming it to YouTube. I'm going to give a brief introduction to our topic and our panelists and their presentation titles. We will have all of the panelists speak in order, and then we'll head into the Q&A session um, for all of the different presentations. So we ask that attendees type your messages into the Q&A feature and be sure to indicate your affiliation and which presenter your question is for. You can upvote others' questions to raise their priority in the queue if there's stuff you are particularly interested in hearing about. And we have asked that presenters not answer questions through text while the other presentations are happening because we want to answer all of the questions out loud at the end so that people on YouTube who can't see the Q&A box are still able to hear the answers. So, as I mentioned, our topic today is exoplanets and their atmospheres. Our first presentation will be revealing the stormy, turbulent nature of giant exoplanet analogs from Johanna Voss of the American Museum of Natural History. Next, we will have observing seasons on a migrating giant exoplanet with the retired Spitzer Space Telescope from Lisa Dang of McGill University. Next, we will have the hottest Jupiters orbiting evolved stars from Samuel Grunblatt of the American Museum of Natural History and Flatiron Institute. Our fourth presentation is a mirage or an oasis, a tentative detection of water vapor in an exoplanet atmosphere presented by Jonathan Brandy. And our last presentation today will be the discovery of debris disks in Kepler habitable small planet candidates by Jian Ge. Now I will go ahead and hand it over to Johanna for our first presentation. Great, thanks. <clears throat> great, great. Um, good afternoon. My name is Johanna Voss and I am a postdoctoral fellow at the American Museum of Natural History. Today, I'm going to share results on our latest program to reveal the turbulent, stormy atmospheres of giant planet analogs. All of our data was taken using the Spitzer Space Telescope, which you can see slewing in the background of my slide there. So in a nutshell, our study finds that young brown dwarfs show more dramatic weather patterns than old high mass brown dwarfs. And as you'll see during my talk, this has really exciting implications for directly imaged exoplanets. But you may be wondering what brown dwarfs are. They're the lowest mass products of star formation and their temperatures range from the highest setting on a pottery kiln all the way down to the North Pole on a cold day. They have a range of masses too. Their masses can be as high as about 80 times the mass of Jupiter. But recently we've started to detect um, a sample of very young brown dwarfs whose masses overlap with those of giant planets. And for these reasons, we can view many brown dwarfs as exoplanet analogs, particularly the young ones. They've got overlapping temperatures, radii, masses, and ages. However, since they're isolated and they don't orbit a host star, it means we can observe them in really exquisite detail. 
And by focusing on these isolated giant planet analogs, we can set some expectations for future observations of directly imaged exoplanets. Um, and one of the incredible types of observations we can do for these isolated worlds is called photometric variability monitoring, which basically means tracking the brightness of a world as it rotates. If a planet or a brown dwarf has atmospheric features such as a large cloud or non-symmetrical banding in its atmosphere, we can infer their presence by looking for fluctuations in brightness as they rotate in and out of view. And it turns out that the Spitzer Space Telescope was pretty much the ideal telescope to look for these fluctuations. And I'm gonna show you a video that will kind of orient you with the sample of brown dwarfs that we currently know of and the sample that have actually been monitored for variability with Spitzer. So we're gonna start at our home on planet Earth and zoom outwards. And um, this video was created using Open Space, which is an open source data visualization software that's developed here at the museum. And as we keep zooming out, you'll see the orbits of planets coming into view. And as we keep on zooming out, we'll eventually say bye to the solar system. And um, in the background, I'm showing you stars, which are colored by their temperatures. So the hottest stars you can see here are in white and all of the brown dwarfs that we currently know are shown in red. This blue grid that has just appeared is there to show you scale. It's centered on the solar system and measures a hundred light years across. And um, so you can see that we're completely surrounded by these brown dwarfs. And this video really nicely shows how close they are to us. And right now I'm showing you the 100 or so brown dwarfs that have been targeted for photometric variability with the Spitzer Space Telescope. So we've stared at all of these objects for about 20 hours each, looking for signatures of clouds. And um, next, I'm going to highlight only the brown dwarfs that are young that we've looked at for variability. And as I mentioned previously, these are particularly telling about the potential weather conditions on directly imaged exoplanets. So we spent over 590 hours which is about 24 days, specifically targeting these young brown dwarfs as part of a large Spitzer monitoring program. And we detect cloud-driven variability in a large number of our targets. And here I'm just showing you some of our variability detections. They all show these brightness fluctuations, which are indicative of clouds rotating in and out of view. And by comparing these new measurements, with the rich literature of brown dwarf variability studies, we were able to compare the young objects and the old objects to find some interesting results. Firstly, we found that the young brown dwarfs are more likely to show variability than their higher mass field brown dwarf counterparts. Um, secondly, we found that the young brown dwarfs can show larger variations in brightness compared to the higher mass brown dwarfs. So their light curves can vary more dramatically than the old objects. Um, and both of these findings are explained um, by considering where clouds form in these atmospheres. Young brown dwarfs have lower surface gravities, so their clouds tend to form at higher altitudes in their atmospheres. And this leads to a higher contrast between cloudy and non-cloudy patches of the atmosphere, which in turn gives more dramatic brightness variations in their light curves as these clouds come in and out of view. Um, and these results are really exciting because they set really encouraging expectations for future studies of directly imaged exoplanets. And um, we'll finally be able to carry out variability monitoring observations of exoplanets orbiting host stars with the recently launched James Webb Space Telescope, which I'm showing on the left, um, on the right, I'm actually showing one particularly exciting system which will be targeted. This is the HR 8799 system of four giant planets that are orbiting their star. And because we've literally spent thousands of hours studying the isolated exoplanet analogs, we know what to expect for directly imaged exoplanets as we take our next steps. 
Um, and finally, I'd like to thank my co-authors without whom this work would not have been possible. I'd also like to thank three high school students who worked with me as part of the science research mentoring program here at the museum. Um, and last but not least, I would love to thank the Spitzer Science Center for facilitating decades of incredible science. Um, and thank you all for listening. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Lisa Dang, uh, and I am a final year PhD student at McGill University chiming in from Montreal, Canada. So it's my pleasure to be here today. And I'd like to thank all the organizers and everyone who's been involved in, in putting this together at the very last minute. Um, so I'm here to talk about some uh, exoplanet results that was recently published in the Astronomical Journal at the end of 2021, where we investigate the climate of a hot Jupiter. And it turns out that we found something unexpected, internal heating on a migrating uh, planet. So our investigation uh, of this hot Jupiter finds that uh, it's heated not only by the nearby star or the nearby parent star, uh, but it's also heated from the interior of the planet. And so this was done using the Spitzer Space Telescope, one of NASA's retired observatory that Joanna talked earlier about, uh, and, and data from Gaia, a European space agency mission. And so hints of internal heating have seemed to be embedded in the atmosphere uh, of Exo 3b which is the planet we, we studied. Uh, and, and this could maybe be used as a proxy to understand the evolution of, of the planet without needing to rewind million years to figure out what happened then. So with the Spitzer Space Telescope, we decided to go after Exo 3b, which is a hot Jupiter uh, on an eccentric orbit or an oval orbit. And so this planet takes about three days uh, to complete a full revolution around the host star. So a, a year on Exo 3b is about three days. Um, and so this means that summers last maybe like a day or so and winters last two days. A typical hot Jupiter are mostly found on uh, circular orbits. And this is because they're so close to their host star and there's strong gravitational interaction between the planet and the star that tends to circularize, circularize the orbit of the planet very quickly. But, one of the mechanism by which a uh, planet migrates uh, in, in their system is via high eccentricity tidal migration, where the planet starts uh, on a very eccentric or like a very oval orbit and via tides, the orbit shrinks and circularizes over time. And so the oval shape that we see here on this very short period planet uh, suggests that we're catching it uh, in the middle of migrating. And so these type of short period planets are very rare. And, and this is one of the reason why we decided to go after this. So uh, Spitzer is particularly well suited to observe hot Jupiters because these objects are big and they also emit a lot of heat. Um, and so what we did is that we used a telescope to basically film uh, Exo 3b as it completed a full journey around the parent star. And so what we obtain is called a phase curve, uh, like what you see here. And essentially, this is a measurement of how bright the system is uh, over time. And this is the brightness of the star plus the brightness of the planet. And so in the phase curve, you see a couple of dip. There is a bigger dip uh, here called the transit when the planet passes in front of the star and a smaller dip when the planet passes behind the star. And so these allow us to constrain how large the planet is, but also the temperature of this planet. So uh, when we looked at an exoplanet from an outside per perspective, the first thing that you see is the atmosphere of the planet. And so when you look at it from the top down, you first have to disentangle uh, climate effects. Uh, but this also allows you to test some climate models. And so this data tells us how bright or how hot the planet is at different time of the year on Exo 3b. From these observations, we saw seasonal temperature variations, hundreds of times stronger than what we experience on Earth. And this is because of the eccentricity of the orbit. The planet receives much more heat when it's closest to the host star than when it's farthest. Um, now, accounting for these climate phenomenon uh, that could potentially explain what we're seeing in our Spitzer data, our data also hints that um, Exo 3b exhibits excess thermal emission. And this extra heating that we saw uh, with Spitzer isn't seasonal, it's seen throughout the year uh, on Exo 3b. So digging further into this puzzling planet, uh, we use the uh, observations from Gaia 
a European Space Agency mission and found that the planet is actually a puffer uh, than, than expected for, for its mass. And so this indicates that the interior of the planet might be particularly energetic, making the planet puff up. And so piecing uh, this with the inflated radius of the planet with the extra heat that we saw with Spitzer, it seems like maybe we're seeing uh, uh, some internal heating or heat coming from the interior of the planet. And we think that there's two possible cryptic sources of internal heating. The first has to do with the orbital eccentricity of, uh, of exo-3b. So because of these tides that, that are, are, are circularizing the, the orbit of the planet, it might also cause the planet to, to sort of oscillate and produce some heat. Another possible source has to do with the nature of exo-3b. So Joanna earlier talked about brown dwarfs and so, sort of those are objects that form like star, um, but, but are, may, not, may not be stars anymore. And so uh, with a mass of 12 Jupiter, 12, 12 Jupiter masses, uh, this object exo-3b lies in the middle uh, between being a regular planet and a brown dwarf. And so if uh, this internal heating, we think that maybe if the planet is actually a brown dwarf, it's still burning or it's still nuclear fusion is still happening in the core of the planet. And so this is, uh, this is what we're seeing on exo-3b. Exo-3b not, might not be a regular planet, but it might be uh, not necessarily a failed star yet, but at the peak of, of its, uh, its lifetime as a star. And so we're showing here that exo-3b is particularly interesting uh, and an interesting target for future observations. But also it revealed another piece of, of the puzzle. These eccentric planets are also heated from below. And this is something that we need to account for when we look at exoplanets or eccentric exoplanets. But maybe we can use this internal heating as a proxy to investigate the past and the history of the planet figuring out what happened before, how long it was on an eccentric orbit, um, and maybe other things about their past. So uh, this, is, this is it for me. And I'd like to thank all of my collaborators, the Spitzer Science Center, and everyone who's helped uh, putting this together. OK, great. Um, well, uh, thanks to uh, the AAS and thanks for all the organizers um, for this opportunity. So uh, I'm Sam Grundblatt and I'm a postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History and the Flatiron Institute. And uh, today I'll be talking about the hottest Jupiter's transiting evolved stars, which should be experiencing all, all sorts of storms um, and intense um, you know, changes as uh, talked about in the previous talks um, as they're in very extreme environments. Uh, in fact, uh, these planets are in such extreme places that actually less than 10 years ago, uh, no one thought that they actually existed, um, which can be explained through a sort of crash course on stellar evolution. And so stars start off as a cloud of dust, uh, which collapses into a disk with a central protostar. Um, that then becomes a sun-like star, which can potentially host planets. Um, that evolves then into a giant star, which might destroy planets, and then eventually into a supergiant, which almost certainly can destroy planets. Uh, followed by a dusty planetary nebula, and finally a white dwarf. And so when I say evolved star in this talk, uh, I'll be talking about subgiant and giant stars. Although in other contexts, evolved star can be used more generally to refer to anything past the main sequence. Okay, so going back to 2013, uh, there were no planets uh, who, which were known around these evolved stars as defined in the lower left corner of this plot. Um, but here's how that situation changed over the next five years. Uh, surveys like Kepler and K2 showed that planets could potentially survive on relatively short periods around these evolved stars. And so uh, you can see that we're starting to build up a population, but there's still a lot of um, questions that we need a larger planet population to, to answer. And so here's what we found in the first two years of the uh, test mission. So the planet sample has now almost doubled with uh, planets discovered by tests shown as stars on this plot. Um, half of which were actually discovered by our Giants Transiting Giants test guest investigator program. And so uh, in addition, TESS has now led to the confirmation of the three shortest period planets ever found around evolved stars, which are all individually quite interesting, but also allow us to start thinking about this population of planets as a whole. And so I, I'm just going to jump into discussing each of these new systems. Uh, so the first planet I want to talk about is a TOI 2669b. Um, so the phase folded transit of this planet is shown on the upper left, um, where the original light curve for this planet is shown on the bottom. 
uh, which illustrates just how little data was used for us to find this planet, less than 25 days worth of data. And so the, the corresponding radial velocity curve, which constrains the motion of the star due to the planet's orbit, is shown on the right. And additionally, the, the black line on this plot illustrates what a perfectly circular orbit would look like, whereas our best orbit models, which are shown in gray, seem to prefer a slightly different shape, suggesting the planet orbit is eccentric, like the planet Lisa was just talking about. This could extend a pattern in evolved systems that was first pointed out using uh, the pre-test sample of planets. Next on our list is TOI 4329b. Uh, so the planet transit can be seen again on the upper left and the radial velocity data it can be seen on the right. And the relatively deep transit of this planet is good for observation by the recently launched James Webb Space Telescope which could measure the amounts of water and carbon dioxide in this planet's atmospheres through precise spectral measurements of the planet transit. Measuring the abundances of these molecules with James Webb can tell us more about the location where this planet formed and will provide constraints on how far the planet had to migrate to end up at its current orbit. Finally, the last newly discovered planet I'd like to discuss is TOI 2337b, which is one of the highest density planets ever found around an evolved star, which orbits a host star in less than three days. I'll quickly point out the scale on the planet transit depth and the radial velocity signal, and then flip back to the previous system for comparison. I'll just do this a couple times. Um, so you can notice that um, while TOI 4329b is um, you know, very deep transit, but not so strong radial velocity signal, it has the average density of as like quark. TOI 2337b is actually 10 times as dense, more like a solid block of aluminum. And so this planet also seems to be inducing tidal variations in its host star, which we can actually measure in the out of transit light curve shown on the bottom of this plot. And this indicates the star and planet are likely interacting quite strongly, which I'll come back to in just a second. So what are these new planet discoveries teaching us about the entire evolved transiting planet population? So here uh, we're showing all known hot gas giant planets as a function of planet radius versus incident flux or stellar irradiation received by the planet, where the color of the point indicates the planet mass. I've highlighted the previously known evolved planets with squares and the planets found by our survey with stars. And you can see that the evolved planets are usually smaller than average for a given incident flux. This implies that the planetary heating in these systems is maybe not as strong or as efficient as it, it would be in other hot Jupiter systems, which I think makes sense if you consider that these systems have a relatively short lifespan. In addition, uh, planets on short period orbits are predicted to be pulled in toward their host stars at faster and faster rates as those stars evolve into red giants. And so here I'm illustrating the average expected lifetime of all known planets. The important things to note on this plot are the arrow and the diagonal lines. So as planets get closer to the upper left corner of this plot, they should spiral into their host stars more quickly. And so the high mass and short period of TOI 2337b imply that it has less than approximately 1 million years before this happens, giving it the shortest in spiral time scale expected for any known planet. And so when we actually looked for evidence of this orbital decay as a change in test transit times, though we couldn't actually detect any clear change. But as test observations continue, our precision on that transit period will continue to improve and uh, you know, hopefully can constrain these transit times more precisely in the near future. And so in summary, uh, TESS is really revolutionizing our ability to find these evolved transiting planets, revealing the hottest planets transiting evolved stars on the shortest period so far. Um, thanks to TESS and ground-based radial velocity follow-up, we can see that these planets are inflated, although less so than main sequence systems. And in addition, the rapid changes of the star combined with the short orbital periods of these planets imply these planets should be consumed by their host stars faster than almost any other known planets. And continuing the study of these systems should tell us how giant planets move throughout their lives, how that affects their smaller neighbors, and then puffs them up during a fiery death dive into their host stars. And just as a quick bonus, here's a future of what the studying these planets with tests could look like. All of the small stars on this plot are new planet candidates waiting to be ruled out or confirmed. Thanks for listening, and I'll pass things off to the next presenter now. Sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm Yoni Brandy, and I'm a graduate student at the University of Kansas. Um, sorry, I was muted there for a second. 
Uh, I'm happy to be here with my advisor, Ian Crossfield, presenting some work we've done to characterize the atmosphere of the Super Neptune TY 674B. TY 674B orbits a small red dwarf star, 42% the size of the sun and 150 light years away in the southern sky. It's 1.3 times the size of Neptune, uh, which makes it about 5.2 Earth radii and 23.6 Earth masses. Uh, it orbits its host star just under every two days, and it's about 635 Kelvin. It was discovered by NASA's test mission, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, in the first year of its observations. And it got our attention for further study for a few reasons. Planets the size of Neptune and a bit bigger are very uncommon at these short orbits, leading to what astronomers call the Neptune Desert. Planets in the desert are very rare, possibly due to losing their atmospheres from intense stellar radiation or because they migrate away from these closed orbits. These competing explanations mean we need as much data as possible on these planets in order to find out how they arrived in their current states. In addition, because it's a good sized planet orbiting a small star, it has a very large transit signal. Every time the planet passes in front of the star, it blocks about 1.3% of the star's light from our line of sight. This makes it relatively easy to study compared to many other planets. Finally, most planets that we've discovered are likely to be bigger than Earth and more like Uranus and Neptune, for which we still don't have a full understanding in our own solar system. Studying as many of these similar planets around other, other stars could help us understand how our own gaseous planets came to be. In 2020, we used NASA's Hubble Space Telescope to spectroscopically observe the planet's atmosphere for three separate transits. As the planet transits the star, the starlight filters through the planet's atmosphere, and different gases in the atmosphere will absorb different amounts of starlight. By spreading the light from the star out over all of its component wavelengths, as seen in the cartoon on the left, we can measure the size of the transit at each wavelength, giving us the spectral features caused by the gases in the planet's atmosphere. Uh, an animation on the right it indicates what this might look like if you were looking at the star. Hubble's Wide Field 3 Camera, in Wide Field Camera 3 instrument has two spectroscopic prisms suitable for near infrared study, where several common atmospheric gases are known to be strong absorbers. In particular, we use the 1.4 micron prism on WIF C3 to look for evidence of water vapor, methane, ammonia, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. However, Hubble spectra are often affected by strong systematic effects from the spacecraft and instruments, so we need to properly model and correct for these effects to get a clean spectrum and identify which gases are present. In order to determine which gases could be responsible for the features we see in the spectrum, we use the petite red transcode to perform atmospheric retrievals. These sample lots of possible values of all the relevant planetary parameters and use them to make a synthetic spectrum, which is then compared to the observed spectrum from Hubble. By changing which gases are used for each retrieval, we can identify which combinations fit the observed data best. We also fit for the planet's temperature and whether there are high altitude clouds that could be obscuring part of the cloud top, part of the atmosphere, which would flatten out the spectrum below the cloud tops. After we sampled all of the parameters, uh, we get a scenario, we get a value of how likely each scenario is. By taking ratios of these likelihood values, we can find a quantity called the Bayes factor, which measures whether one of two models is more likely than the other. Larger Bayes factors mean more confidence in the higher likelihood model. By removing these absorbers one at a time, we compare each of them to a model, including all of the absorbers. Uh, and our results in this case favor the presence of water at a base factor of about 3.2, corresponding to 2.1 standard deviations or a p-value of less than 0 0.03. We don't find that any of the other possible absorbers, including the presence of opaque clouds, meets the standard for significance. In conclusion, we think we see water vapor in the atmosphere of TY674b, which is really exciting, of course. Uh, there are only a handful of warm Neptunes so far where we've been able to do this, and we think there's even potential for more interesting science to come out of this planet. Since TY-674b is so deep into the Neptune desert, our next logical step is to search for atmospheric escape. In order to look for this atmospheric escape, we'll be looking for an especially deep transit 1.8 micron, where helium has a particularly strong absorption feature when irradiated by starlight. We can do this with Hubble, but we can also do it with powerful ground-based telescopes, which mostly aren't as sensitive to the water feature we looked at in this work. These would give us much more precise observations and a better measurement of potential atmospheric evaporation. If present, TY-674b might eventually lose enough mass to be on its way out of the Neptune desert. We also weren't able to precisely measure how much water is in the atmosphere of TY-674b, and we didn't find evidence for any of the other possible gases in the atmosphere. We also didn't try to measure the total metal content of the atmosphere or how much of the atmosphere is made of elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. In order to measure these abundances more precisely and determine the metal content, you will need to use the recently launched James Webb Space Telescope. JWST gives us sensitivity to several other major features, including methane and carbon dioxide, 
and will be able to distinguish between heavier clear atmospheres and lighter cloudy atmospheres. Weighing the atmosphere and measuring the water abundance more precisely will give us information about where TY674b formed in its solar system and how significantly it may have needed to migrate in its early history to get to its current position. Any information we can find out will help us understand this intriguing population of Neptune-like exoplanets, both in and out of the Neptune desert. To summarize, we found evidence for water vapor in the atmosphere of TY674b, a nearby Neptune-sized planet in the desert. JWST will allow us to precisely measure how much water is on this planet and also hint at other aspects of its formation and evolution. By continuing to study the planet, we'll also be able to understand more about other planets in the desert and possibly even our own solar system. Here's my contact information and thank you for your time. Good morning, everyone. I'm Zhang Ge from Shanghai Astronomical Observatory. It is a great pleasure to be here to present our discoveries of zydeco dust emission in three potentially habitable planet worlds from the Kepler mission on behalf of our team. And if you happen to be a world traveler, you may be lucky to see zydeco night yourself at a remote place, uh, such as Hawaii or La Palma in Spain in the night sky extending upward from the uh, sun right after sunset of a clear day. And uh, actually I was one of these lucky one and seeing beautiful zodiac light when I traveled to Hawaii in 2025, uh, 2015, sorry. Um, or if you are, happen to be a, a rock, rock band Queens fan, then you may have heard zodiac dust from uh, big news in 2007, when the British uh, rock star Brian May finally got his PhD in astrophysics on studying zodiac dust clouds. Then you may wonder what causes zodiac night? Well, zodiac night is produced by sunlight reflecting off um, part dust particles uh, generated by asteroid collision and the comet activity in the solar system. In other words, if we can detect zodiacal light from a distant planet system, then this system likely has components like asteroids and the comets, which can't be easily detected directly in other ways. Then how to detect extrasolar zodiacal dust? Well, it is extremely difficult to detect zodiacal dust in the visible at the far distance because the star is very bright in the visible band to outshine very weak zygote night. Luckily, uh, zygote dust absorb heat from sunlight and re emit radiation in the in infrared. Uh, if they reach a temperature similar to our body temperature around 300 Kelvin, they radiate most of the flux at the middle and the far infrared. In other words, we will be able to see much brighter dust emission in these weapons to be easily detected because the star radiation become much, much fainter at this far middle infrared, which is shown uh, in this diagram. And in 2018, the NASA Kepler team released its last catalog of 47 habitable planet candidates. We were wondering if this habitable world has the dark dust like our solar system. In 2019, we started to do research in this area we collected online data taken by many different space missions and the ground-based survey and conduct, conduct detailed analysis of their energy distribution at the different wavelengths. After over two years of study, and finally we are able to identify three systems showing significant middle infrared thermal emission. Actually the latest um, data released from the ground-based UCUT uh, telescope and also from the Speed, uh, speed space telescope has played a critical role uh, for us to remove thermal radiation contamination from this uh, faint companion near to this uh, star. And these allow us to have very accurate measurements of infrared radiation access by the dust and confirm our earlier discovery. And here's the list of uh, the first detection in the Kepler 1229 system. As you see, um, this star is a red no mass star and with a clear infrared excess caused by uh, the dust. And uh, this temperature is around 430 Kelvin, which is a slightly higher 
than our uh, star dust in the solar system, which is between 130 to 390 uh, Kelvin. Here's our second one uh, in Kepler 69 system. 69, uh, Kepler 69 is a sun like star, actually, it's like our sun. And the matter star dust temperature is around 430 Kelvin as well. And here's a third one um, uh, in the Kepler 395 system. Kepler 395 system is uh, uh, another red low mass star. The matter star dust temperature is slightly lower than the first two, is around 390 Kelvin. After detection, actually, we went back to the Kepler light curve and, and did the measurements of their rotating speed. And two of the stars we found, they have the very strong uh, spot activities. So we're able to measure their rotating speed. We found their rotating, they rotate much faster than our sun. So it indicates they are much younger than our sun. In fact, their age is around one billion years uh, compared to our sun is about 4.6 billion years. So they're indeed much younger. But the other one is Kepler 69. Unfortunately, uh, we couldn't find any spot activity on that star. So which indicate they are much older. So therefore in the end we measured, you know, we, we estimate that old that age is probably around 10 billion years considered with the previous uh, uh, observation. And here's our uh, artist's impression on Kepler 1229. As I mentioned, you know, Kepler 20, uh, 1229 is a red star. And, uh, and you can imagine, you know, uh, the, 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 the night may look very red. Um, the, since this is in the heaven zone, uh, its surface may cover water. Uh, these planets may host life. If it does, we were wondering, you know, if a uh, rock star like and there would get inspired by their star night and write many beautiful songs like what the brand may did on Earth. And here's another artist's impression on Kepler 69C uh, planet. Since Kepler, uh, Kepler 69 is a sun like star and the planet is outside of the inner edge of the heaven zone. So we can imagine that this planet's atmosphere and the surface look like those of our Venus. And it, it may have a runaway greenhouse effect on its surface uh, and the atmosphere. Its atmosphere may be thick and uh, hot while the surface could be extremely dry, like we, we draw here. Uh, here's the, um, um, uh, the conclusion of our findings. Since uh, JWS was just launched and is on the way to the uh, is Lagrangian point to start observing very soon. So we hope we are able to follow up this system with JWS soon to reveal more detail about these habitable planet environments. Below is the list of um, uh, our contact information. Please feel free to contact us for any questions related to these discoveries. Thank you for your listening. Excellent, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so we're gonna do something a little unusual here, uh, which is that we've heard about a number of collaborators and um, we're gonna go ahead and promote a few of them to be panelists right now for the Q&A session. So we're adding in Ian Crossfield from Kansas, uh, right? University of Kansas, yes, who is Jonathan Brandy's collaborator. And then we're also adding in uh, three members of Gen Good team. So these are Amanda Howe from Aragon High School, Justin Ho from Henry M. Gunn High School, and Kevin Willis from the Science Talent Training Center. So these are all folks who were involved in the studies that were presented, and you are welcome to direct questions to them as well. So we've got a few lined up here already. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the first question here is from Rick Feinberg of AAS, and actually this was echoed by another questioner, uh, Jennifer Wiseman, uh, which is, how do you know that the brightness variations are caused by clouds rather than say hot spots? Sorry, did I say that's a question for Johanna? I, I think you did, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, the truth is to really know what's driving the variability, you need something other than just the Spitzer light curves that I showed to really dive into what's causing variability, 
you need spectroscopic monitoring. So you need spectra as a function of time. And you can do this with the Hubble Space Telescope um, using the WIPC3 instrument that others um, used during this session. Um, but this has been done for quite a few brown dwarfs with similar temperatures and the clouds and hotspots have these different signatures, um, what they would do to the spectra over time. And in all of the brown dwarfs we've looked at with similar temperatures, it seems to be that they're always driven by clouds as opposed to hotspots or other things like magnetic spots or aurora are also possibilities. Great, thanks. Uh, this is a question for Lisa from Chris Coconuts from Astronomy Magazine. Uh, is this the first observation of seasonality on an exoplanet? And can you talk about the future of detecting more subtle seasonal changes on other kinds of exoplanets? Yes, thank you very much for this question. Um, so this is not the first time that we observe seasonality on an exoplanet. Uh, it's been done with Spitzer a handful of time before, actually two times if I, if I think correctly. Um, however, I just wanna mention here, these are not the same seasons that we experience on Earth. So the reason why we experience the seasons on Earth is because Earth is a little tilted, uh, not because it's a, in a particularly eccentric orbit. So it's the first time that we observe this kind of uh, of seasons, but we've only observed them on, on planets outside of the solar system and on some solar system bodies. Um, and then for the future of, of uh, observing eccentric planets and, and other climate or seasonalities on, on, um, on exoplanets, it's going to be done with the James Webb Space Telescope that a lot of people have mentioned today. So actually there's a lot of programs to observe normal hot Jupiter on circular orbits. And there's a few to observe highly eccentric um, uh, planets like HD 80606b. Um, and what I'm proposing is that for those, it's hard to, to look at a very eccentric planet for a whole orbit because you have to stare at it for a year. And we're not going to waste a year of, of James Webb time on this. So we're only we're looking at a portion, but Exo3b with a three-day orbit is actually maybe we'll be able to have uh, to observe like more of a year on Exo3b. Um, so yeah. And so other climate things that we're going to observe with, with James Webb. So James Webb is more powerful than Spitzer was. Um, it's going to observe uh, things like molecules on the planet and might even tell us whether or not clouds are forming or, or raining out. Um, so these are all exciting ideas that we're going to look at in the future. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, just a reminder to the panelists, please do not answer any of the questions in writing. And the reason for that is that we are uh, streaming to YouTube and they can't see what's being typed in the question and answer box. So we're gonna try to answer all of these out loud. Okay, so next question here is for Sam from Joan Najita of NOR Lab. Uh, wow, great results. What explains the aluminum-like density of high density planet? Does it have a, metal, a metallic composition and how did it end up with that high density? Yeah, that's a, a really great question. Um, just a quick question. Can I share my screen right now? Yes, absolutely. Okay, awesome. Because I have a slide that's kind of related to this, at least. Um, so here, uh, basically, I'm trying to show the sort of four new planets that we found in our survey um, as modeled with like one particular sort of reinflation model. And as you can see, these planets are kind of like all over the place and only one of them seems to actually even intersect with any of the models that we see. And so um, the, the, basically what, what I'm trying to say is we don't really know what this planet is made of or why it's so much more dense like 10 times as, as dense as another planet in, in this sample. Um, that probably has something to do with how these planets formed and potentially what their cores are made of. So uh, for this particular planet, TOI 2337b, it's likely that it has a much uh, larger or much more dense core than some of the other planets that we found in, these, uh, in this sample. Um, but we really need to sort of expand what we know about these planets um, or the sort of models that we can use to describe these planets to, to actually understand, you know, what's the interior structure of this planet? How did it get to be so dense while the other planets in these samples are, are so um, low density? And uh, that, that'll that require some additional modeling that's beyond what's what's been done so far. So yeah, we're, we're still trying to figure it out. Great, thanks. Uh, so I've got a question here for Jonathan uh, from Chris Kokonis, Astronomy Magazine. What other possibilities are there if not water vapor? And how many exoplanets have had water vapor detection before this? So um, the, 
the molecules I listed were, were sort of the main absorbers in this near infrared band. Um, but the only one that's really concerning uh, for, for overlap with water vapor is methane. And when we actually compared our full model to um, the methane lacking model, we found that it actually had the least significance of any of the absorbers we tried. Um, so we don't think that methane is actually contaminating this water vapor feature. Um, and for total planets, um, I'm going to restrict it to planets that are sort of similar to the one that we were looking at. Um, it's probably under 10 uh, Neptune-like planets with water vapor uh, observed in their atmosphere. Um, but if you branch out to things like hot Jupiters, um, you can also find a few more. So. Uh, this is a question for Lisa from Monica Young of Sky and Telescope. How long does it take for hot Jupiters to circularize their orbits? That is, how lucky were you to find this planet in the act of migrating? Yeah, um, thank you very much for the question. So how long does it take for a hot Jupiter to, to circularize their orbit? So we think that it might take like only a couple, like at least less than a giga year, but um, but this system is two giga year old. And so it was surprising that it was still uh, not on a circular orbit. Um, and then I, for, I forget what the second question was. It was how lucky were you to find this planet in the act of migrating? Yeah, uh, actually we didn't find this planet. Uh, this planet was already found uh, way back in, in 2008. So it's been known for a little bit, but it's one of the rare hot Jupiter that is on an eccentric orbit. So we're very lucky. <laughs> I don't know. I think we're very lucky that we found this exoplanet uh, to begin with, but I didn't find it myself. <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, we had a question for Jen from uh, Rick Feinberg of the AAS. What do you think of the recent claim based on Juno spacecraft data that the zodiacal dust in our own solar system comes primarily from Mars and or its moons rather than primarily from comets and asteroids? Well, <clears throat> so it's possible of you know, recent days <clears throat> but if you look at the history of the solar system, you know, there is a lot of violence uh, events going on in the past. For example, asteroids, you know, they collide with things uh, themselves, but also they collide with moon and other, they don't generate a lot of dust. And even nowadays, the comets, you know, continue to produce dust as we know that, because like uh, meteorites is all come from those, the left of the dust uh, from the comets uh, uh, trails. So therefore, uh, what this claim, uh, it, they definitely show some new evidence about, uh, you know, possible uh, creation of dust from the Mars and this uh, moon. But I would uh, suggest, I, I certainly see the most probably come from the other other events in, in the past, including the current way. So. Okay, thanks. And I just want to take a moment now uh, to ask our two high school students who are present, Amanda and Justin, if the two of you would be willing to give us a, a sentence or two just talking about your involvement in this project. Yeah, sure. So I started the project in the beginning of my sophomore year in 2019. And we were initially looking over the 47 like list of how to planet candidates given by Kepler. And with the help of Professor Goa Kevin, as well as Justin, we looked through several databases and research papers in order to find and detect zodiacal dust. So it's been a really collaborative like team and research project. Yeah, for me, uh, it was roughly the same like idea, but um, I actually joined the project around the summer of 2020 um, in my late sophomore year. Uh, yeah, so I've always been relatively interested in astronomy. I used to go stargazing with my across the street neighbor on our telescope. Um, but I like also wanted to do like deeper analysis on like the actual observations that we were making rather than just like observing it. Um, so yeah, when the opportunity presented itself, I <laughs> tried my best to seize it. And um, yeah, the opportunity has been a great experience for me and Amanda. That's really cool. It's great to have you guys here. All right, we will go to a question for Johanna from Camille Carlisle of Sky and Telescope. Uh, young brown dwarfs are warmer than old brown dwarfs. So is there a, a concern that the young brown dwarfs warmer temperatures make their weather easier to see because everything's brighter and that's why you're seeing more weather. In other words, it's not that their weather is intrinsically more dramatic than the weather on older dwarfs, it's just easier to detect. Well, cool, thanks for a great question. 
Um, it's true that finding young, uh, young brown dwarfs that are the same temperatures as old brown dwarfs is hard, but we have actually managed it. And this monitoring program kind of happened at the perfect time because it was the last cycle of Spitzer, but it was kind of the first time that we had a sample of young brown dwarfs that are the same temperatures as the old brown dwarfs that have been studied today. So we were able to compare young and old brown dwarfs, but they had the same temperatures and the same everything else. So we were actually able to isolate the effects of age there without worrying about temperature. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is a question for Sam from Corey Powell. Uh, some people have suggested that ring systems could mimic the appearance of an inflated low density planet. Could you be seeing in part that ring systems do not survive around evolved stars? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think that in general, um, because we're seeing this sort of interaction between the star and the planet in these systems, that's telling us that the dominant forces here are actually the tides um, that are being raised on the star. And those are so strong that they probably will, you know, destroy any sort of um, ring system that could be in orbit around these particularly short period planets. Um, that being said, we haven't seen any evidence for a ring system, but it's possible that if we keep looking, maybe something will pop up, um, maybe at a long, longer period system, or um, that, that can survive in some sort of other way that we haven't come up with yet. So uh, yeah, so that's, that's what we think so far. Great, thanks. Uh, this is a question for Jonathan Brandy uh, from a name that I'm guessing is not the actual name of the person. So from Anonymous. Uh, what can you learn about the planet by learning the abundance of water vapor in its atmosphere? So the, the amount of water vapor present in a planet's atmosphere is important because it can tell us a little bit about where the planet formed in its system. Um, so there's a, a, a location that we call the frost line, um, interior to which uh, volatile species like water tend to be irradiated by their host star and, and, and stay in their evaporated states. Um, but, but further out, these can actually condense and freeze into solid materials more available for making planets. Um, and if you have a planet that, that forms outside of a frost line and accretes quite a bit of water, and then through some other uh, evolutionary process migrates in towards the star, um, that would look different as if you were measuring the water abundances than a planet that was formed interior to the frost line and couldn't accrete as much water. Um, so that can actually give us some information on these formation and evolutionary models um, that, that we, don't, we don't necessarily have a, a full understanding of yet with the current sample of exoplanets. Great, thanks. Uh, this is a question for Lisa from Chris Kokonos, Astronomy Magazine. Is it possible to observe or know the planet's axial tilt and does that have any effect on the season? Yeah, that's a very good question. So I'm going to say that axial tilt definitely have a, uh, an impact on, on the climate of, of, of a planet and, and might even uh, be seen in our observations. The only thing though, it's very difficult to measure the axial tilt of an exoplanet. So far, it's, it's barely been done. Uh, actually, it's, it hasn't been done, um, but uh, how it's going to, to affect the climate so far, it's something that we can only explore theoretically and we cannot see them uh, in our observations yet, but maybe with future uh, missions like James Webb, or maybe not James Webb, but future mission with precise, more precise observation might allow us to start seeing um, effects from, from axial tilt or how we call it, we also call it obliquity. Great. Um... Let's see, we've got a shout out that is rising in the comment thread here to Amanda and Justin from Chris Kokonos. Uh, not a question, but a shout out for your work and passion, good for you. <laughs> I agree. Um, a question for John, also from Chris Kokonos. What will it take to observe active formation of smaller objects and will those be asteroids and or moons? I think this is a great question. Um, then in fact, uh, since you know we've found quite a few only a few in the habitable planets, you know, system. Um, I would say that uh, in the future, if we able to follow up, you know, I actually right now, I'm luckily I'm the leading uh, a, a space mission called us 2.0 mission, uh, will observe, can you observe Kepler field once launched maybe by around 2026. So then we'll continue monitor those system. 
then you know, because this is the edge on system. So the very luckily, you know, you might be able to see some of the moon or maybe asteroids, you know, maybe some of the transit events with this, with the edge signal ratios, you might be able to see some, you know, you know, you, you know changing um, uh, of the events. And that could be the one way to do it. Otherwise, you know, the asteroids, you know, moon is too small. I, I doubt it the other way you can, uh, you know, observe them. So, so I think transit might be a good way to, to do that. Okay. Uh, this is a question for Lisa Dang from Corey Powell. Uh, for future research, is it possible to model expected internal heat fluxes and compare them to observed heating? I'm thinking about the long-term goal of understanding internal heating of rocky planets of, around M stars. Yes. Um, yeah, in the future, hopefully, uh, modeling is going to, uh, at least we're going to have enough understanding of exoplanets in order to model them with uh, phenomenons or, or physics that we think is happening on these planets. Um, one thing that I would say, though, uh, when thinking of rocky planets, a uh, habitable zone or a more like temperate and smaller planets that have smaller signal, these uh, uh, sort of like um, internal heating or uh, processes may not happen as strongly on these planets. So it might be easy to just sort of like forget these processes when we're trying to model small planets or small like normal planets. And so it's useful to go towards extreme like hot Jupiters or other like very cold, very hot, very big, et cetera, to sort of look for, for um, indices of, of physics that might be only very apparent on these like more extreme system that afterwards can inform or modeling of, uh, of targets that, that might not have as strong of, of these effects. Great, thanks. Uh, we've got a question from Jen, from Jen Nijita. Uh, congratulations on the cool results. Can you speculate on the broader context for these results? Do you expect that all stars have zodiacal dust or just those stars with planets or only a subset of stars with planets? Yeah, this is another very, uh, very good question. Uh, in fact, uh, um, right now, obviously we only see a you know, a few, you know, three out of 47. So therefore uh, I would say uh, maybe right now, maybe it's just limited by the wise data because we use wide data to find the infrared access. Um, so therefore is the current limit. We only can say the very small percentage of the, of the planet system, you know, those uh, has the, those zodiacal uh, like dust. Um, but but that, that means once the sensitivity improved, we may see more system has the weaker, you know, the dust emission you know, possibility. Um, but regarding the, are uh, they related with the planets? Actually, is a very good question. We did a study, unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about here, but we did a study compared with the uh, uh, control sample without uh, uh, you know, the, the transit planets, and we didn't find any uh, correlation, at least for habitable planets. And, uh, but well, this correlate with the giant planets, that is uh, ongoing research by uh, Amanda and uh, Justin. Hopefully, we'll, in a few months, we'll be able to provide an answer on that. But in the earlier study by other uh, groups, uh, not on this, uh, you know, transit planet, uh, but they did find some kind of strong, uh, uh, sort of correlation with maybe giant planet. So that's what we want to find with this our way. And uh, especially given now they have the you know latest release from speeder, you know, observation of the Kepler uh, data and also the Euclid data. So they allow us to do very detailed analysis. So that hopefully we can answer those questions. That will be very interesting uh, to know uh, in the future. So. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. All right, and the last question that I've got queued up here uh, is, I think you mostly answered this previously, Jonathan, uh, but if there's anything you wanna add, can you discuss for the public what the importance or implications are of ongoing water vapor detections for understanding exoplanets, in particular the class you're working with? And this came from Chris Kopinus, Astronomy Magazine. Yeah, I think I would, I would at least for this particular planet, um, focus on formation pathways, especially because it's now currently in a space of parameter space that we don't expect many planets. Um, so anything that can tell us about the formation and evolution of this planet gives us more information about other planets in the desert. Um, but looking into the near future, um, possibly JWST cycle two, um, being able to just precisely measure the abundances of water vapor and other possible absorbing species in general, um, is something that is really exciting to a lot of transit planet people in general. And uh, I hope we get the chance to do that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, all of you.
that made it through our list and in perfect time. So I will turn this back over to Macy. All right, thank you so much to all of our speakers for sharing your exciting science with us and for answering all the questions. Thank you to the audience for being here and asking so many great questions. We wanna thank the PIOs who helped with the press releases and with the briefing prep. And lastly, we wanna thank our sponsor, USRA. Coming up later today at 2.15 Mountain Time or 4.15 Eastern Time is our final press conference for this week about intriguing stars and citizen discoveries. So we'll see you then. Thank you.